and welcome. My name is Jacob and this is Trade Happy, a platform for traders around the world to be happy and consistently profitable. Now in today's video we were supposed to have a podcast but unfortunately some things came up that's going to be pushed back to a later date. We do have some amazing podcast guests coming up in the next couple of weeks so stay tuned. But in today's video I thought it would be good for anyone trying to pass FTMO just to hear some advice and hear some of the experiences from previous FDMO traders that we've had on the podcast. We've got 90 minutes of just amazing advice from FDMO traders. So remember to sit back and take some notes. I'm just going to let the podcast play. I'm doing analysis, reading, trying to understand uh, what was going on in the broader economic scope. Try to really like grasp that and also, you know, kind of wrestle the personal issues because I'm sure, you know, if you're not personally in a good place, it's going to come out in the trading. So you got to always make sure that you're, you know, in a place that you want to be where you're happy before you're um, putting your attitude to the charts. Yeah. And did you have to change your strategy at all to fit with the FTMO challenge? Um, yes and no. So... Like I was saying before, you know, I've, I've gone through different courses, let's say. They're not like formal courses or anything like that. But, you know, just different mentors, let's call them, that teach different styles of trading. And so I think up until, let's, let's say, last year, December, I was familiar with a lot of different trading methods. So um, whether it's long-term swings or just like short scalps, I knew a, a bunch of different methods. And I think I was transitioning to being a, like leaning more towards swing trading. Um, once I started to get a certain understanding of the economy and of markets. Uh, and then I think the rules of FTMO kind of forced me to alter that a little bit because, you know, you can't hold things over the weekend, things like that, you know, the various rules. Um, and just dealing with stuff like uh, the swap increasing, um, the spread increasing at, at such and changeover. I don't know if you're trading at that time, but that happens a lot. Um, things like swap. So it did it did require me to change um, a little bit. But I think that my overall look on the market, how I'm analyzing, how I'm planning trades and things like that are pretty much the same. I'm just getting in and out of the market more often just because of that right. you know, weekend rule. Yeah. Um, so can you briefly describe your strategy? Uh, yeah. So including kind of like chart back testing or, or research. Uh, yeah. So what would, what's your strategy for actually trade in the markets? Yeah. So before I actually decide what pairs I'm going to look at, I try to get an overview of the fundamental drivers because I think a lot of, uh, traders miss that piece. And while I don't think you necessarily need to have a great understanding of that to be successful, I think it really helps, um, at least for the way that I think about the market. So I try to look for, okay, this week or this month, you know, whatever uh, political economic time frame that we're, that we're in or climate that we're in. So right now I'd be looking more like week to week instead of month to month, just because everything's very shaky different countries are making different decisions, sometimes quickly, sometimes drawn out. So because there's so much uncertainty, I'm going to be looking like more week to week. So for like for this next week, um, I haven't done my, my kind of research for the week yet, but what I'll be looking at is things like uh, manufacturing numbers, uh, interest rates, any like changes or any news or announcements around things like that. And then based on kind of what I see out there, um, I'll say, like, for example, if I see that GBP has um, a strong reason to continue falling, which I, I think it does. I haven't done my research yet, but I, I think it does. So I'll look at, at GBP and I'll try to find within the GBP cross pairs, uh, which are the best opportunities for me to get in cells. So I'll kind of then just trans transition from a fundamental point of view to then looking at technicals. So I'm saying, all right, well, I already know that I'm looking for more downward uh, movement on this pair, these pairs. So now I'll just do kind of my markups, uh, my technical analysis, and highlight areas that would be good to enter short. Um, then, assuming I don't have you know a million zones and a million horizontal lines everywhere, 
I'll uh, you know shorten that down to a couple key areas, um, and then I'll just kind of wait and I'll see what happens when price gets to those different areas, and I'll, and I'll decide to make my trade um, on whatever day or whatever time it gets there. So what do you use to actually get those fundamentals? Is it just like a free website or do you pay for something? Uh, yeah, so nothing is nothing is paid for. Um, I do pay for a sort of group that I'm in and there's some news that that guy sends uh, simply because he, has, he does market research for an actual institute. So he shares some like a particular point of view that, that he has. Uh, just based on experience. So I do pay for that, but the other websites that I use are all free. So I use something called uh, Finviz, F-I-N-V-I-Z. Um, and that just gives me an idea of, let me mute this, I'd start popping up. Um, <laughs> um, so I use that for an idea of the indexes. So like dollar index, euro index, GBP index, stuff like that. And that will be like just a one confluence, let's say, for how I'm determining my uh, my bias for, for the pairs. Um, so I'll just kind of look at that and see what forecasts are, um, <clears throat> see what the different types of traders in the market are doing. Um, I also use trading economics, uh, market economics. So those are the main websites that I use. Uh, and then outside of that, it's just kind of research on news that's out there so i'll read the economist i think the economist is pretty good for kind of high level views of where things are heading uh the economist i think has a very nice uh fairly unbiased way of presenting what's going on so i think it makes it a lot better to make an unbiased decision yourself because uh, we got to remember that we need to be unbiased in the market um so i'll read that and then, you know, I'll get an idea of like, oh, China's doing this, Japan's doing this, US is doing this, whatever. Uh, and then I'll, I'll go on, like on local websites. So um, websites that are local to whatever country. Um, so whether it's like Business Insider or Bloomberg and then going on Reddit and trying to find articles from different countries. Uh, I'll do that too. Just anything that I can kind of get my hands on that I know is not going to be, or that is trustworthy information, basically. Right, yeah. So you mentioned that you combine the fundamentals with the technicals. Right. Um, do you use like any indicators for your technicals or what kind of things are you looking for? I mean, honestly, not really. The most I'll use is moving averages. Um, and that's only for like entries within my key levels. I don't even like use the, the, the moving averages on higher time frames, like daily or weekly. Um, so I'll do my analysis, just regular analysis based on uh, weekly, daily, four hour, mm -hmm. and then assuming price gets to somewhere that's interesting to me, maybe I'll go down and I'll just use my EMAs and try to see if that can give me some precision. Um, but honestly, like even sometimes with that, I don't use that. <laughs> like, um, you know, if you've been trading for, for a decent amount of time and you have a, a pattern that you look for, or whatever you want to call it, just something that you notice, whether it's a time of the week or time of the day that you always enter or a specific candle pattern, like whatever it is, like after you're doing it so many times, you kind of know what you what you want. So certain things just look good to you. Um, yeah. So I don't really, I try not to rely on indicators as much. And do you think that uh, traders need to put in that time to the charts to learn those things and those patterns? It's a good question. Honestly, I think it depends on what type of trader you want to be. Because if you're going to be a trader that's holding things for a week or for a month, or I shouldn't say a week, maybe two, three weeks or multiple months, you don't necessarily need to know like analysis super well. You can you can get away with some pretty basic support and resistance. Now you might need to use a really wide stop loss or no stop loss. But let's say that you're just basing things off of fundamentals or just basing things off of interest rates. That's a strategy that you know works for you over a longer time frame. You don't necessarily need to put in time to learn chart work, to learn precision with like candles, um, any theory of price action. Um, but, you know, it's like an art on its own almost. Um, I, I guess I could make an analogy like, you could be a doctor, but 
you don't necessarily need to specialize in the art of surgery, right? Like you can be a doctor for other things and have a good idea of fitness and the human body and things like that, but you don't necessarily need to be really great at surgery to be a good doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I wouldn't say it's always like really necessary. It just depends on what you're trying to do at the market. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so during your FTMO challenge, is there anything that stood out to you that you were doing well? Hmm. Um, honestly, I would say that it helps to go for a lot in a little bit of time, if that makes sense. So if you know that, like, it's really good to capitalize on a big move. Like if you're if if you're unsure about something or it's not quite exactly what you what you want, it doesn't quite exactly meet your requirements. Uh, and let's say you you lower your risk a little bit, that's fine, right? Because you don't you don't feel comfortable, whatever. So I would say that I did a really good job of when I was feeling comfortable and confident in the setup to just kind of go for it and not shy away from like a typical risk size or even adding more risk simply because I knew that there was like kind of something else on the line other than money if that makes sense um yeah. and i think that was really helpful because if you get let's say uh, a four thousand or five thousand dollar day i mean that's half of your challenge right there and then it sets you up in such a good position for the rest of it uh because now you can lower your risk size no matter what and be kind of a little bit more conservative and you'll probably still be okay assuming you're still making equally good decisions um so i feel like not being afraid just because of the fact that it's like this challenge aspect to it so there's like an additional component of failure like usually when you're trading it's either you win or you lose the trade but now it's like oh either i win or i lose the trade and i could lose the challenge so i feel like yeah. if you kind of just separate from that and stick to your normal pattern of trading or your normal routine it makes it a lot a lot better because that's kind of the goal after all right is to get more familiar with things that make you uncomfortable and make them more comfortable so yeah um so do you think that um someone that might be losing on a smaller account once they actually go to ftmo do you think that they could possibly be profitable because they have that larger account uh if they're losing on a smaller account and then they have a bigger account yeah um maybe it depends what the reason is that they're losing Right. If they're losing because they set a 20 pip stop loss and they just get knocked out of market or the move every time and then it goes their way. Yeah, maybe more capital would help because it would allow them to use a small lot size and widen the stop loss to somewhere that makes more sense or gives them more room mm -hmm. to work with and can allow them to stay in the trade. So like, yeah, that's definitely something that could be fixed by having a larger amount of capital. Um, I would also say that having a larger amount of capital gives you more confidence and confidence is such an important part of trading um but it also opens up the the avenue for bigger losses too so that is definitely one thing to be to be weary of um but yeah like i said i think it just depends on what the mistakes are <clears throat> like if you're for example someone who's losing consistently because you're just over leveraging or failing to take profit or I don't know, just doing kind of ridiculous things in the market. Um, I don't think that's because you're you're working with a lot of uh, a little amount of, of money. I think it's because you don't know what you're doing, or there's something else that's affecting you that's spilling over into your trading, or there, there's something else there. So I think that in most cases, if you're making like bad decisions with a small amount of money, it's not going to be any better with, with more amount of money. So um, yeah, that's that's what I'll say on that. Yeah. Do you have any advice for traders looking to do FTMO from your uh, experience? I, yeah, I would say don't rush. There's like really no rush at all. Like, I would say the biggest mistake that people make is that, I don't know, maybe they only have a year of trading or two years of trading and they think that they have like a good understanding of technicals or fundamentals or just their strategy, whatever the case is. And so they're like, yeah, you know, I've, I've been doing fairly good. So maybe if I go for this big amount of money, it'll, it'll make a big difference and, and things like that. But I, I think you got to always give things a little bit of time because I think 
over time you realize that like the fear of missing out or FOMO that kind of goes away the longer you trade because you realize that even if you miss the 400 pip move candle like one hour candle today like there's gonna be another another day where not necessarily that happens but there's gonna be another day where there's a big move that you're gonna catch like uh and i think that's a really big hurdle to get over in trading because i think a lot of times uh even in my own experience i used to do this a lot uh, early on i would maybe get in a trade it would go let's say 100 pips i'd be very happy with that and i close and then i would be really upset when i see it continue for two three hundred more pips uh and then maybe the next time i try to go and hold that 100 pip trade uh with maybe a generous stop loss and profit and I try to go for that extra 200 or 300 and then it just doesn't work out when I do it. But then every time I, you know, take profit, it seems to go the opposite way. I think like that could be a very limiting, um, like cycle of, of a mindset to get stuck in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to have you conflict it with yourself. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. I think the time is like a really important factor in, in terms of learning lessons like that and and others. I think that was just, that was maybe more personal to me, but I think that lesson and others is something that you only get with time. Um, so I'd say don't rush. Like if you're even if you're winning like every every trade that you take for two months, like I would still say give it some time and like try to make yourself go through more ups and downs because I feel like if you're able to go through those ups and downs and like, uh, I guess, observe your emotions and figure out how to handle them. Then if let's say your drawdown is negative 30 and you had such and such emotion and you were able to battle it and win and maybe you took the loss and you grew from it and you rebuilt the account or maybe you just held the drawdown and it ended up going your way, like whatever you learned from it, when the case is you're in 30,000 drawdown or 3 million drawdown, it will be kind of the same. You'll just be like, oh, it's extra zeros. It's not, you know, like I've been here before. I've been in this predicament where I've been down X percentage or whatever, mm -hmm. and it felt really bad, but I know how to react in the situation. So I just feel like the more things you expose your, yourself to in the market, the, the better a trader you'll be uh, over time. Yeah. And do you think that traders need to trade an actual live account before doing FTMO or do you think they could go straight from a demo to a live account? Um, I don't know. I think that's just going to be like person to person. It's such an individual thing. I mean, I think it just, it goes back again to like your ability to manage the emotions. Um, if having a real account is going to change your emotions a lot, what like when you make the transition then yeah it's definitely gonna be hard i mean but you, if you if you're gonna make it work you gotta get over it um mm -hmm. so it's it's hard to make it feel like it's a real account when you know it isn't um but i mean i, I think it's doable i mean anything's doable i think as long as you kind of make up your mind about what you want to do with your trading and you kind of stick to that um i think that is a key because like I was saying before, you don't want to be in a situation where you're internally like battling with yourself because of past experience or past trade or, or whatever the case is that's making you feel that way because it kind of just makes like, there's so much uncertainty in Forex that the last thing that you want to add to that pile of uncertainty is your own individual <laughs> uncertainty. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, so during your FTMO challenge, was there one trade that stood out to you in a good or bad reason? Um, good or a bad trade? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, what was this? Uh, I think it was in... February or March, I had a trade on Euro JPY that essentially won the challenge for me. Um, it was really, um, it was a weird trade for me because, uh, so it was a, a trade where basically I caught the initial move, there was a pullback, and then I added more to the pullback. And the second move off of that uh, initial impulse was like 
280 pips to, like by the next day when I woke up. And um, the re-entry that I added, so normally I would just go in with like a standard, maybe like 1.5 or 2. But for whatever reason, I just went in with five lots. And mm. I really don't, I like it. It was kind of silly, honestly, thinking back, but I'm glad I did it, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess that was one that, that stuck out to me because it, I achieved my goal. I didn't really have to do anything spectacular. And I think it was one of those moments of, I don't want to call it clarity, but just like, no, no, there's no fear in like me using such a high lot side. I was just kind of so confident. I was like, I've seen this move before. Fundamentals make sense. Like everything makes sense. And it's just like, you know, if I lose the trade, I lose the trade, whatever. But I, there's a, a strong potential I'm not going to lose it. So I kind of just went for the, the extra lots and it ended up paying off. Um, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take you to develop your strategy and actually be consistently profitable with it? Oh man, I think it took well over a year and a half, two years. Um because I think that there was, I think there's like kind of tiers within, uh, within trading. Mm -hmm. And I think that once you get to like the top of uh, one tier, right before you're going to get to the next tier, there's something weird that happens right before you get like, let's say that last puzzle piece that fits together that allows you to jump to the next tier. There's something weird um, that like that happens there. Um, but I think that once you get it, it's really helpful in your shift to understanding a higher level of trading, a higher level of functioning. Um, and I think that is something that you need to, to chase. So in other words, never being like complacent with where you're at in trading. I think there's always, always, always more to learn, even if it's more to learn about the same thing that you've been doing over time. Because even though you have one strategy, someone else can use that same strategy and look for even different subtleties within it. Um, so, I mean, it, it really took a while um, of, of soul searching, I think as well, because you also like your trading uh, method, your trading approach has to also fit who you are. Like if you're someone who doesn't like to micromanage things, you can't be a scalper because what's the biggest like thing that you have to do as a scalper? You have to manage your stop loss. Oh, there goes another 30 candle or another hour candle. Move my stop loss or add a position or you know, hedge the other one, like whatever it is. Like you're always going to have to be doing uh, a micromanaging task in some way. So I feel like your trading style has to agree with uh, like who you are as a person or I guess how you like to work would probably be a better way of saying it. Um, hmm. So I think that the reason it took so long is wasn't because of any difficulty with learning Forex itself. I think it was more the difficulty of also figuring out what it was that I like to do. Um, everyone figures that out at a different point um, in their life, whether it's when you're 20 or when you're 35, like everyone does it at a different point. Um, so I think that is equally uh, as important of a factor to figure out as it is to figure out how you want to want to trade, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the reason why for most people it takes upwards of two years, three years to become really proficient. And um, I feel like maybe any task, really. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Forex is different, yeah. but uh, different and difficult in its own way. But I think like really any task um, is is that you have to figure out how you fit in to, to the domain of the task and how you're going to kind of use your best self to get the best results out of what it is you're working with. Yeah. And so was it a difficult process for you actually to become a prof profitable trader? Um, yeah, I would say, I would say it was difficult. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think that Forex is a great it's a great thing. It gives you freedom. It allows you to capitalize on your knowledge, it, it opens up a lot of different opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but it's honestly, for some people, just simply not the best way to make money, right? Like it's kind of the only job where you get punished monetarily for making mistakes. And for some people that's really detrimental. Like imagine, uh, again, back to like that analogy, 
like imagine a doctor who like every time they made a mistake in surgery they like got fined an amount of money or like got charged some conduct points or some ridiculous thing like that yeah. it might make people like really weary of becoming doctors because like you know they get treated badly or they always have to pay when they make mistakes or something like that so like honestly it's not it's not the best way when you think about it on, on that type of scale of making money like it's not really a surefire way of making money it has a lot of stress there's uncertainty there's uh things that could happen that really mess you up um like for example if if in our current climate you know if trump makes a weird tweet like that could inflate the market or deflate the market a, a sizable amount but like if you're you just like working in a restaurant no one's gonna hopefully like come by and like throw a grenade in there you know like they're not gonna just like make it really difficult for you all of a sudden to run your business so yeah. um for a lot of people it's not the best way of making money and it definitely is a difficult way of making money um so i feel like you have to be committed more to the other benefits of it outside of getting the money to you know even have the courage to continue doing it because it's not a safe uh occupation if that makes sense <laughs> like you know like every day you have to show up yeah. It's kind of like uh, being like a professional athlete um, in, you know, in soccer and football, like whatever. When you're performing in like a tournament or at the highest level, you are always going to have people that are kind of rooting for you to fail or trying to take your number one status, right? So you have to like show up every single day and like be the best like that you could be, but also make sure that the best that you could be is better than everyone else. And that's like a really hard thing. Like there's really not too many jobs or professions that you have to do something quite mm -hmm. as stressful. So um, yeah, I definitely said, it, I, would, I would think it, it, I would describe it as difficult um, because of, you know, the different things that you got to grapple with, the different factors. And it, it really, you have to really take control of it, right? No one's gonna, you don't have a boss, you don't have a company or anything like that to shape your decision or your thinking. It's really kind of all up to you. And um, for some people that is like really uncomfortable and, and like not the best way of, of making money. So yeah, yeah, I would definitely say it's difficult. Yeah, 100%. Um, so when you did, when you were starting that journey of becoming a trader, was there anyone inside or outside of trading that you looked up to? Hmm. Inside and outside of trading. Um, let's see. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's different people in, so the, the reason I'm struggling so much to, to answer the question is because I feel like every domain has a certain type of personality that you can recognize. And it's like very similar. Like it's someone who's like kind of been an all-star. They're like well respected. Um, sometimes they might have let's let's say controversial uh, statements or something like that. But you can tell that they're always trying to be honest and trying to get at the root of an issue, or they're really just not trying to bullshit people. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. And I feel mm -hmm. like you see that everywhere. Like you see it in sports. You see it in banking. You see it in law you see it in medicine right you see it kind of everywhere and i think that instead of like naming one particular person or group of people i feel like i look for those personalities within the domains that i'm interested in right. um and i try to just like see what it is that they're doing right because a lot of the time like there's a reason why people become famous why people become popular why people achieve the success that they do and so i feel like it's important to pay attention to them if that's what you're trying to be in your respective field because they all have some like of course they don't have the the same experiences or like the same upbringing or the same uh, level of education whatever like there's tons of different qualities throughout all those different people but I think that you can narrow down certain ones that they all have, whether it's work ethic or routine or like anything like that. I feel like those are things that I like look out for and I try to emulate. Um, so I, 
I feel like so when I'm doing research about like banking in the US at least <clears throat> and it names like different bankers or different institutions I'll like look up those institutions and try to read more about you know how that person got there how that institution grew so much or whatever and you'll find that some of them were really sneaky and like maybe they used private equity to like a really weird advantage to like gain their wealth um that might not be someone that i personally want to emulate i'm not saying there's anything wrong like with that i'm just saying that like that's not how i'm trying to do things mm. so like i'll be aware of that and i'll be like all right maybe i don't want to pay attention to this person as much or when i do pay attention to them i keep in mind what they did to to get that money or to get that respect or, or something like that um so i feel like instead of like looking up to someone i kind of evaluate people based on what it is they stand for and how they got there and i try to like use that as like a, I'll, i'll use the word confluence again you know how like what to take from them yeah. you know what i'm saying so like yeah. it, back to that example of if i know that like i'm trying to be a really good banker or like a really good like financial advice like whatever it is and i look at one banker and he like was really sneaky he like broke a lot of laws or like used a lot of gray area laws and like sneaky back channels to like get his wealth like while i might respect him for his like economic view because he understands clearly how the economic uh like wheel functions i might not respect as much like what he says about like moral business at like ethics <laughs> you know what i mean so like I'll use kind of what who they are as a person to see like what it is about what they're saying uh that might have more value or like less value. If that makes sense. I know that was kind of yeah. a long answer. Yeah, it's like so, you're, you're peeking um, behind the curtain, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I never take everyone just anyone just at like their face value of mm. of what they're saying because as we've seen uh especially I think this year that's a very dangerous thing to do. You always got to uh so to speak follow the money and figure out you like what's kind of going behind, going on behind the scenes yeah yeah i, um, I like that answer yeah. <laughs> um so what do you see in winning traders that you don't see in losing traders um but i don't see any losing traders um so i don't see winning traders panicking um I don't see them taking a lot of trades. Excuse me. Um at least the ones that I know <laughs> and the ones that like I've come across in my learning experience, I see winning traders are very calm. They're always taking the same types of trades. They're not looking, they don't have seven setups that they're looking for in the market. It's like how do you even how do you even keep track of that there's 20 odd, 20 something odd pairs or 30 something odd pairs like how are you going to have eight different trading setups that you could trade and then also 30 pairs or whatever it is and then like try to figure out the best one like you're going to be running in circles trying to figure it out so i feel like like there's a, a underlying method um and there's also a drive that doesn't stop So they keep going and they don't stop until they figure out what it is they need to get right and once they get it right they continue to do that and I feel like uh the other aspect is is being calm and not having the stress because the time is going to pass anyway the wins and the losses are going to pass anyway um so you know you might as well try to remove that stress piece and and be as like free flowing as possible Um I think a lot of losing traders they try to ask why instead of understanding why or trying to like see where they are wrong they try to like maybe put their ego into the market and say well like oh it's always happens to me or, or yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> you yeah. know um I think just good good traders are are calm they don't rush into anything um there's no point to rush into anything And I think that goes back to what I was saying uh, before that that only comes with a certain level of experience and time in the market, right? If you're a new trader, it's so easy for you to get frustrated because you might take two trades on Monday and two trades on Tuesday and you lose all four of them and then next thing you know the same trades that you took uh if you had kept your stop loss and didn't close the trade early like on Thursday they went into profit and like, you would have been up a good percentage or something like that. And those might be uh you know 
small little things that people get really upset at new traders and experienced traders losing traders where an easy fix is just patience and waiting um i think a lot of uh, like prominent uh, investors have said like you make more money when you just sit on your hands when you just wait on that you know one key setup or that one thing that you know will play out like if GBP announces more really bad Brexit news. Like, why would I be trying to like look every hour of every day to try to find a buy on GBP? Like, no, let me just wait for like the induction move or the false move or whatever it is that I'm looking for, and then just go pretty hard in on the sell because it, it makes more sense. You know, like sometimes the trade that you see playing out. Day to day, right before you, that you're missing out on isn't the real move, and so like losing traders might get so caught up on like, ah,、oh, I should have been in the buy, or I should have been、yeah. in the sell, like I knew I should have done that, like why didn't I? You know, instead of doing that, like maybe focus on what the bigger picture is because you might reveal that you're actually in a better place because you didn't trade.、Mm-hmm. Um, I think also、um, winning traders have.、Uh, What I describe like an an intuition, maybe, if that makes sense. Where like, even though they have like a specific set of rules and whatever that they that they go with, I feel like they know when to break them. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like something might not meet all your criteria, but you're like, oh, it still looks good, but you can't really say why, <laughs> but it kind of just does. You, do you know? Does that make、yeah. sense? Like, have you yeah, ever experienced yeah. that? Yeah. So I feel like there's there's a little bit of that too in in winning traders,、um, and I think that's something that comes、uh, with with experience too. It's like,、um, you know, if you're if you're doing like any sport,、uh, and you see someone do like some crazy play, whatever it is, typically it's because they've done it like a lot, just like messing around in practice or、mm. you know something like that, and. They were in the game situation. They kind of just didn't think about it, and they're like, "Oh, it, it seemed good. It felt right," and so they just did it, and they they end up with like this,、uh, this like all star play or whatever. I think it's something a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say makes you profitable? What makes me profitable?、Hmm. I. Hmm, that's really a difficult question, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um. I would say not taking wins or losses to heart is a big is a big reason. So what I mean by that is if I place a trade on, all right. So I I did my you know weekly analysis whatever. I have my zone set up. Monday comes along, I take a trade, I win three thousand. Tuesday comes along, I take another trade, I win three thousand. Wednesday comes along, I take another trade, I lose two point five. Um. I didn't, I didn't do anything differently across those days that made me win or lose, and I think that's an important thing for people to realize. Like,、yeah. you can't force anything to happen. All you can do is react. And so, if someone something goes your way, you aren't any better because of it, and you didn't do anything better to make it go your way. If something does does not go your way, you're not any worse for it, and you didn't do anything specifically for it to not go your way. Like. Regardless of you entering that trade, whatever happened, still would have happened, and I think it's important for people to realize that. And I think that once you realize that, then you'll be able to to remove a lot of that fear that could block you from from making progress. Because literally, like the market is always right. Like you can never be you can you can never be right and the market wrong. You know what I mean? Like、yeah. that it it just doesn't make sense. You can't say, well, oh, this doesn't make sense. Like if The news was this. It should have done X, Y, Z, or whatever. Like, yeah, you can say that, and you can not understand why, but it doesn't mean the market's wrong. Like, the market is always doing what it's supposed to in search of equilibrium. Yeah, yeah.、Um, so, what advice would you give to someone who maybe struggles with discipline or patience when actually trading their plan? Um.、Hmm. I would say, in a case like that, examine your habits, maybe, and examine what things you do throughout the day 
And if there's things that put you in a frustrating, uh, you know, like an aggravated state, figure out how to fix it before you trade. And so I, what I mean is like, you don't have to never be in that aggravated state ever again your entire life. You just want to make sure you're not in that state while you're trading. So you need to figure out like what it is um, and figure out how you can fix it. So maybe there's something within the issue that if you just resolve that issue, then you can continue that activity and it will just won't put you in an aggravated state. That might be one option. Another option might be that no matter what you do, that activity is always going to bring you aggravation and you can't stop that activity for, for whatever reason. That's fine. But now you have to make sure that you have some routine that you do before you approach the charts that gets you out of that state and into one that's going to like be better for trading. Um, so whether it's like finding a song that puts you in a good mood and just listen to that song like a couple times or an album or... Maybe you need to go for a run or do some exercise, stretch out. Uh, maybe you meditate. Uh, maybe you look at yourself in the mirror and like talk to yourself and say like whatever. Like it could it could literally be anything. Maybe you play video games and that calms you down a little bit. Um, like find something to do that gets you out of a state that's not, you know, favorable to your trading, and get into one that is going to be a little more calm, a little more zen, so to speak. And I feel like that will help. And if it doesn't help your trading, maybe it helps you understand that trading is not gonna be right for you. Um, because I think that's another factor too. If you're constantly frustrated and you're trying really hard not to be frustrated, maybe and like you, you still can't solve it, it could be that trading is not for you and there's really nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, or it could just be that Forex isn't right for you. There's other ways of trading, investing your money that could uh, could remedy those those situations, right? Like it could be just that the very nature of how forex is just doesn't agree with you. Cool, go trade stocks or go trade futures. Like there's other stuff that you could trade, or just invest in, in companies, like like become like an actual like IPO investor or something like that. Like there's other things that you can do to still grow your money or have your money work for you. I mean, you can do e-commerce. There's millions of things you can do yeah. to to make uh, to make money. Um, so I feel like if a lot of times if you're looking at it from the perspective of just making money, that might bear its own frustration because as we were talking about before, it's it's not the best way of making money. It's not a very secure and solid way of guaranteeing money every single day. Like some days you'll have it, some days you don't. Um, so yeah, I feel like that just, you know, figure out a routine or just something to get you in better mood. And I think that will, will probably improve your, your trading. Yeah. So what does your average day look like? Do you have any routines that you do? Yeah. So I do yoga every morning. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's my way of being like fairly calm and like relaxed and, you know, like kind of awake, you know, I think you feel very awake and attentive when you stretch out. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a full yoga uh, like routine uh, of progressions. Like you can maybe just like, you know, do a couple push-ups, maybe some jumping jacks and like stretch your legs and stuff. That might be enough for you. That's cool. Like whatever, whatever, get whatever works for you. Uh, but yeah, that's what I do. I do yoga. Um, and then I read for a little bit, similar to how I was reading before we, we started here. Um, so I'll do like some economist reading or just some general news, like see what's up in the world while I like drink coffee or whatever. Uh, and then I'll look at the charts, see, you know, what looks good. If I see like a very sharp, aggressive move and there's a lot of volatility in the market, I'll probably just stay away or maybe check back in a few hours and see like what the four hour candles did and see if they created any opportunities or if it was a fake out or something like that. But generally I'll stay away from that. Um, if I see a lot of consolidation, then usually for me, that that's a good move um, or, or presents a good opportunity one way or the other. Um, and then once I'm like either, I shouldn't say done trading for the day because I don't always just day trade. Like sometimes I do intraday. Um, so if I'm, if I'm in the trades that I want to be in for the day, I'll just call it a day and I'll check the charts, you know, every now and then if I'm 
mm-hmm. not doing anything, but I'll go make food. Um, I'll study. Like I said, I was studying for school. Um, I'll study a bit, or I'll just read, play video games, like do stuff that normal people do. Like I'm not just on the charts 24/7. Yeah. Um, nor do I think that's particularly healthy, honestly. For your eyes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, well, I, I feel like I just kind of get up, get moving, get my coffee, read a little bit, uh, attack the charts, and then once I've had a successful day, or once I've finished my day, I'll. Uh, try to you know study or some form of that or maybe do a second workout uh, I think that's that's it. I don't have like too strict of a routine Yeah, because um, I, I don't want to get like I feel like personally with having too strict of a routine If you miss something or like start it late and you're too strict about it It can sometimes like ruin the purpose of it Like the purpose of it is not to like be on time and start like a class The purpose of it is to like feel good and like get the benefit of, of the activity so. Yeah I try to like do the same things, but not necessarily the same time every day. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming onto the podcast today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say? And also, where can people find you? Oh, where can people find me? I mean, I don't have like uh, like a like I have a social media, but I don't like put trades on it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess like telegram would be best for trading stuff because like no one's really going to be able to like see my Instagram and and know I'm a trader or anything Mm -hmm. Uh, my telegram is uh, it's pips all day one word p-i-p-s a-l-l-d-a-y if anyone wants like chat or like okay I'll put it in the description below okay cool uh, yeah, and you can tag my uh, my Discord there as well, I guess. It's just Mr. Smith and then the, the numbers. So I guess you could just tag that too. Um, but I mean, I guess the last thing I'll say is just never give up. If, if you're really committed to becoming a trader and you really want to understand the economy and, and everything like that, everything you say and everything you, you say you believe, just, just go with it. Because the only way you're gonna definitely fail is by not trying. So, like, if you if it if you want to do it, go for it. I mean, anyone who's been persistent about it, I think, has made it. And maybe you won't be able to make a living off of it. Maybe you won't be able to be a ten grand a month trader, but that's cool. Like, you can just be a five hundred a month trader. Like, if your goal is just to kind of get some enjoyment out of it and find a, another way to make your money work for you. Um, go for it. Um, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to understand how the economy works and how banks use your money, how investors use your money. Because if they're using that to make great fortunes for themselves, there's no reason why you can't do the same. So if it, if it is something that you're really passionate about and that you, you want to do and you think you can take control of, just the one advice is always keep edu- educating yourself, so always keep reading and just never give up. And, and, that's a good place to be in. For anyone that doesn't know who you guys are, um, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Well, my name is Michael, and I've been trading for about five years now, on and off. But um, basically, I started with binary options, got attracted to the get rich quick scheme in trading. And obviously, that doesn't work out. It doesn't really work like that. If you want to become successful in trading, you have to take the long way around and basically learn everything from the beginning learn the basics so my journey in trading has been very long and that was due to basically it not being very structured i sort of went in did a little bit went back again did something else and um eventually after about three years i met my friend here t and um we started trading together and that helped both of us because i had some knowledge basically and some skills he had amazing discipline and then we joined together basically and ended up trading so i'll let you tell your story as well a little bit <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I'm, I'm T, similar to Michael, I started off kind of attracted by the whole get rich quick. Originally in cryptocurrency, when sort of Bitcoin really started going up in price, thinking I could basically gamble because I didn't really have any knowledge of trading. Eventually started reading up more about it, obviously met Michael, and that's really where sort of my trading progressed. Um, learned, learned, you know, some, some basics, really the basics, learned some strategies. We started working together, sort of combined forces, like I say his knowledge sort of i had the almost like the psychological approach to it as well because i studied psychology at uni and i feel like that helped a lot 
combining forces is what really sort of escalated our trading and actually very quickly as well. Um, I thought it would take years to learn, but it doesn't have to if you have the right approach. Hmm. So did you guys start, did you learn together or was it one of them, te like maybe Margot teaching T how to trade? I, mean, I wouldn't say I like, taught him basically, I just showed them exactly what I did. I showed him some material I learned and then if he had any questions, obviously he came to me and asked me. And, but it was more, again, more of me showing him what to do and then we essentially had a goal and a plan. And for about six months we spent demo trading together and sometimes we'd meet up together in each other's places. Other times we'd phone each other and basically every single day without fail, we'd turn up in the markets and trade our plan. I made many mistakes along the way, but I think our biggest lessons came for both of us when we demo traded and that's where our I'm learning progressed the most. It's, it's mm. almost like, obviously, coming into trading, I wasn't quite, uh, we weren't quite on an even playing field. But as soon as we started working together, I caught, basically caught up to Michael quite quickly because obviously when you, when you have someone who's more experienced than you, ultimately in any field, that's going to help you so much more than just reading books or, you know, watching courses yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, um, you guys, are you both FDMO traders? As in funded traders. That's correct, yeah. We both trade. I mean, again, once we started our um, journey with FTMO back in March, and again, everything we done was together, every trade we took was together, every morning we come in and we have a little conference call, if you like to call it that, and um, every decision we make based on every trade, it's a decision we make together. So, yeah, we both fund the traders, we both follow the same plan, and, and again, doing it together is a massive benefit for both of us, I'm guessing. So, do you have separate accounts, or is it a joint account? Yeah, we have separate accounts. We, he has his own fund account, I've got my own, but then the trading is basically the exact same strategies. Ah, right, okay. So did you take the FTMO challenge to, um, at the same time? Yeah, everything was at the same time. Yeah, we started, I think our, well, day was the 9th of March of this year that we took our challenge together. And as I said, everything we've done was the exact same process, just separate accounts. Right, okay. That's interesting because a lot of uh, traders kind of, most of them anyway, trade on their own and it's quite uh, original I guess to have traders that are doing the exact same strategy and taking the same trades together. I've not heard of that before. Yeah, I mean I think well, what T said before is basically we combine forces and it's um, T's had the psychological aspect of trading, I had the experience and the skill if you like to call it that. and. Again, trading to be a very lonely game. Um, you're on your own normally, it's you and the screen. And if you make mistakes, it's quite easy to just quit. But if you've got two of you there, you can keep each other accountable. And it's, mm. I find it much easier, much easier like that. Ultimately, I find, so, I find tra a very important sort of trait in, in, in trading is discipline. And like anywhere else, uh, like, like in any other really skill or whatever you're going to approach in life. And when there's two of you, you can also you can either like sometimes you, you know you, you you might want a revenge trade or something as an example but when, okay, when you're by yourself it's very easy to sort of think yourself into making a bad decision but when there's two of you you call each other out for example you know oh you're gonna go and uh, open a position which you never would normally open and you can be like hey we don't do this this isn't part of our plan you keep each other far more accountable than when you're trading by yourself at least at least in my experience and i would agree with that well, yeah absolutely yeah so do you have any advice for traders that are trading on their own about how they can keep themselves accountable without having someone else do it for them? I think it's, well, it's important to practice discipline. Um, it's, it's very hard to do, obviously, because it's, it's, easy, it's easier said than done. But I think from my experience, the best thing to do is basically at least surround yourself in groups with traders. Basically, there are plenty of forums on even groups on Facebook or Instagram where you can at least speak to people. And the great thing about that is the people are on the same journey as you. So if you surround yourself with people on the same journey as you, they'll understand you. And if you post something about trying to make a mistake or something, they'll easily guide you to do a better thing, basically. Yeah. Another thing I would say as well is if, again, if you're by yourself, you can't ever deviate from your strategy and your plan. You have to have ice cold discipline. And it's obviously a little harder, I, f I think, by yourself, like I say, but ultimately that's what's going to make or break you. Because if you start deviating and if you start doing things you're not supposed to do that's where you're going to have issues that's where you're going to start losing money it's a, it's a very dangerous sort of path to go down so yeah you, you need to just be you need to have your goal you know in sight and just follow that and you can't do 
You can't be making any mistakes there. Yeah. So if you had to start the FTMO challenge again, would you change anything? Or would you do exactly the same as you guys did? Because obviously you passed the challenge and everything. But was were there aspects that you would change? Uh, well, actually, funny enough, we've actually applied for another challenge just to basically increase our capital a bit quicker. So we're going to start our mm. new challenge alongside our fund account tomorrow. And we're not going to change anything, actually, because it worked out very well for us. I mean, we don't believe in luck in trading, but if there was one aspect, basically, we were quite lucky that when we did our uh, challenge at the beginning, we essentially made our big profits when the whole coronavirus came about. So the markets were very crazy back in March, and we really capitalized on that. And But having said that, we had a very structured plan on how to go about things if we were not if we not had that luck, basically. So if the markets are just basically normal, uh, we will essentially, our first goal is to protect our capital because the way it works with FTMO is if you finish a challenge and you haven't possibly passed the uh, profit target, but you've um, you've managed to keep your risk like they ask you to do. And if you stay in profit after the 20 days of trading, which is a well, calendar month, you can do another challenge for free. So our plan, first of all, is to pre protect our capital and then, basically, we follow our plan 100% because we know our strategy very well. And I think doing FTMO, you need to really know the ins and outs and all the numbers of your strategy. Because you need to know how how good are your good months and how bad are your bad months. So we knew there are certain months in the, in the year, sometimes, that we have a slight drawdown. And we were prepared for that, basically, by saying, okay, if we reach a certain number of losses, we will reduce our risk. And at the same time, if we're winning, we can potentially increase our risk a little bit because we've got a bigger buffer. So ultimately, yeah. we're not going to do anything different because, again, we, we know our plan very well. We know our strategy. And, and that's what makes everything easier because you can trust the process, basically. So did you do, obviously, backtesting, but did you do... Um, what I'm trying to say is, did you use any software when you were doing the backtesting or was it just trading the demo account? Um, our backtesting was actually fully manual, basically. It's, it's a painful process in many ways, but um, it's got to be done, in my opinion. It's, you need to know your strategy, basically. It's, um, you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't know the ins and outs of it, in terms of risk management, basically, it's, it's not going to work. So we had to basically mm. go back two or three years and see how every year performed and how every month performed and so on. So um, it will be easier with software indeed, but that's possibly going forward when we use some software trading, but at the moment it's all done manually. Right, okay. Um, so kind of going off from FTMO, um, what does your average day look like? Well, average day we... Or is there an average day? Um, yeah, I mean, well, right now it's a bit different, obviously, with our whole world pandemic, mm. um, but typically we'll wake up at around half past six in the morning, and our trading is the first thing that happens, so we trade the European Open session, so our trading starts from 7 a.m. and usually we're done by 9. Sometimes it goes a bit longer, but we'd like to be finished by 9 or 10 at least. And and then basically after that, it's our own free time. We've, we're both very passionate about the gym. So that's actually how we also became very close and work on ourselves because we both go to the gym. Um, so we usually gym two, three hours and then again, just work on self-improvement, uh, discuss future plans. And and yeah, that's about it. I think I'll add to that. Yeah, well, actually, about the gym as well, it's, it's funny you say we met there, but it also I also find that it really helps my trading. I think Mike would agree. Absolutely. Because ultimately, in the gym, it's about doing, it's about taking small steps every day over a very long period of time to achieve a goal. And that's essentially what trading is, because it, I used to approach it almost as like, right, let's go in there, let's try and get a big win, you know, a lot of risk, risk like 20% on my account or something. That's how you blow up. Same thing in, you know, in the gym, you have to take small steps every single day and eventually you'll achieve, uh, achieve your goals. That's right. It's like laying mm. that one brick until you basically build a whole house. If you like it, it takes it's one step at a time. And, and again, that, that's how we, at the gym, we keep each other accountable. We help each other at the gym and we do that in trading as well. So. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, with the psychology kind of, of applying the gym to the trading and taking those small steps. Um, so would, can you describe your strategy in one sentence or two sentences 
Um, just for anyone that wants to get an overview of what you guys do. Well, our approach to trading is basically we like to keep it simple. Um, it's we again we trade the European Open session, so we're in the UK and Scotland. So at 7 a.m. in the morning, the markets tend to move a little bit more than from overnight session in Asia. Um, so we trade two markets only. We stick to that because again, it keeps things simpler. We trade one currency pair, the GBP USD, and we trade the DAX index. And basically, on the GBP USD, we look for breakouts. We tend we've seen a pattern basically that overnight. The price action seems to be very quiet during the Asian session. So we look for sort of like London Open breakouts, we could call it, but it's some kind of our own variation of it, basically. And then the DAX seems to be quite an aggressive market sometimes, which we quite like. So um, we essentially look at previous day's levels. We look at the highs and lows of the previous day. And we look at the gap, and then we either decide to fill the gap or ride the gap, if you like, depending on the price action on that day. Hmm. Um, okay, cool. So I guess you kind of touched on it. Um, what I was going to ask next was what does your typical trade look like? Um, do you have like a set stop loss and take profit or is it something that's a bit more fluid? Yeah, well, um, usually our stop loss, for example, will be uh, most recent high, most recent low or perhaps a strong level of structure. Um, we determine our position size based on the distance of our stop loss. And then our target, again, it could either be a previous level or sometimes it's a fixed ratio of at least one to one reward to risk. And basically with our approaches, we don't overtrade. So the way our strategy works, we can only place a maximum of three trades. Sometimes we finish the day with one and done, which is fantastic. Other days we have two. And then there are some cases if we, for example, lose one of the trades, we have a second chance entry basically. Um, and yeah, we place a maximum of three trades in a day. And again, most of our trading actually in the morning is literally sitting on our hands and waiting for either a setup or sitting on our hands mm. and waiting to manage our risk. To basically, once we reach a certain level of profit, we, for example, reduce our um, we reduce our risk to break even. And that's how basically how that's how we approach it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how long did it take to develop that strategy? Well, it's actually it's quite a bit of a long story because we, when we first met, we were kind of more into trading stocks. Uh, we, had a, oh, okay. we had an approach to trading stocks basically where once again, we just trade the open. So at half past two UK time, the New York stock market opens, which is obviously half past nine in New York. And we um, essentially, we love the momentum and the volume and the volatility of the open in New York. Um, however, we found that with FTMO, um, Basically, the way we want to trade stocks is not really, we're not really able to do that with FTMO because the brokers they offer don't really offer that kind of trading, which is fair enough. It's 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 quite a, you could call it a bit higher risk because again, the volatility and that. So we can't trade that way with FTMO, even though you can trade stocks overall, but not the way we want it to. So then I sort of had to basically go back to my Forex sort of strategies I used to trade back in the day when I first started. Because once again, all my life, all my trading life, I wanted to basically trade very simply, trading the open, just placing one or two trades per day. And I had developed a strategy sort of over, again, the London open session, basically. And it didn't take that long to develop it, really. It just the, the hardest part of it all was actually the risk management. Because the strategy, any strategy can work, really, if you have sound risk management in place. My biggest mistake back in the day was that I would trade the same way I trade now, However, I have much worse risk management. That, for example, I'd always take my profits early and I'd let my losers run. Whereas now, especially having two of us, we just always decide, no, we're, we're sticking to the plan, at least one to one worth the risk. And basically, yeah, so to answer your question, it, it didn't take that long to develop a strategy, but it took quite long to basically practice trading it, if you like, because um, even though we didn't fully practice the specific strategy, we had a lot of experience on trading stocks on, on demo accounts. So, um, it was more about taking the time to basically master trading it rather than developing it. It was also a bit of a readjustment period because the way we traded stocks, we were influenced quite a lot by um, quite quite a well-known YouTuber Andrew Aziz from Beable Traders and, and, and his methods. So it's, it's a very sort of high, quite a high risk, not so much of a high risk, but it's a very sort of high frequency style of trading. You can be doing a lot more than three trades in a single session. You can... Um, you trade extremely high volatility, obviously markets, because you're looking for, 
definitely looking for big moves. Whereas this is sort of, it's, it's a lot slower. Uh, obviously, it doesn't take, does, it takes way longer because we would probably trade stocks for what, Michael, probably about up to half an hour. That's right, yeah. Whereas right now, you know, we could be trading until, <clears throat> well, usually it's about 10 so it's a very different a different approach to trading but also was quite quite novel to, to sort of experience that because going from from stocks to the, the forex market and also the dax it was it was a very it was an interesting trend transition to make and also a good learning experience yeah is the psychology different have you found um trading in that short period of time because obviously, I can imagine that there's a lot of new traders that are going to want to overtrade in that small period because they think after that period's done, they're not going to be able to trade. I mean, that, I think that depends on the individual because, I mean, for example, I can't swing trade personally because I'm not a fan of waiting, for example, only for one or two setups per week. For me, I have to have at least one trade per day, but I also don't want to overtrade, so I only want to do one or two. It's a bit strange how that works. Um, I think... I think it depends on the individual how risk tolerant you are, um, and I know overtrading can be a well, it is one of the main problems of people that trade. But that's again, I just think it depends on the individual. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you guys use um, any fundamentals when you trade? Even though it's quite short term, do you have like an, an overall fundamental guide? No, we don't actually know. We um, again, the way we used to trade stocks, we would only basically look for stocks that have had some either earnings or um, uh, mergers or something like that. But with with our strategy yeah. in forex and then with the DAX, we just basically it's it's all to do with price action basically and technical analysis. There's the only thing that affects us with fundamentals is with FTMO. If there's any major news released, we are not allowed. We are not allowed to open trades two minutes before to two minutes after the news has been released. But so far we found that it's not affecting us at all and um, again for us the way we look at news like we, we wouldn't if it's good news doesn't mean the stock's gonna go up or something or the, or the price gonna go up the good thing about news is we know that when there is news it typically means that this, the price will move quite aggressively if you like so I think yeah we we don't really take into account what the news is and essentially uh, with trading forex and DAX we don't again we don't look up on the mouse at all right um and being quite short-term uh, traders in terms of trading every single day, do you use algos? Is that something that you've had a look at or considering to do in the future? Um, no, we we haven't. Um, we haven't. We don't use them at all just now. No, I mean it's possibly we, we are thinking about going forward to automating one of our strategies, and um, simply because it is sometimes painful, painful just sitting there for three or four hours and no setup happening. So one of our strategies um, will most likely look to automate at some point, um, but at the moment, no. Also, it just shows that you know, again, if you if you do have a very simple sort of binary strategy, and you and you're not able to code it or you don't know how to or you don't want to, you don't need to. You you can just obviously sit there and wait, and that, that's that's an approach. You know, you don't. Some people obviously will have that knowledge or will will pay someone to automate them, but you, it's not it's not a necessity, obviously. Yeah, I suppose if it's um, a really simple strategy that you can code, it takes the emotion out of it as well, doesn't it? Um, especially for newer traders or struggling traders, it could be quite good um, to do. Of course, yeah. So what was the, I guess this is for both of you guys as well, what was the most difficult process of becoming profitable for you? I think for me was basically. Or, or was there anything? For me was basically the fact that um, I couldn't get to grips. I, I basically spent too much time looking for the holy grail. I was looking for a strategy that would return me 20 to 40 percent a month, and and that was mainly because I was always looking from the approach that I will start trading with maybe 1,000 to 3,000 pounds only, obviously a small account. Mm. So I was looking obviously I was trying to get those massive gains because. I was somehow trying to get my account to grow quickly. So my biggest process was basically shifting from that to actually then realizing that, no, it's actually much better to trade with, say, 50,000 to 100,000 pounds and, quote unquote, only making three to 5%, which is obviously much more realistic, much more achievable. And it's, again, trading is, is a business where it's not about the more time you put in. 
it's the more money you have, the more money you can receive by the same amount of return. It's it's, it's a game of percentages. It's not about a fixed amount of pips or a fixed amount of um, fixed amount of pounds per day. It's a game of percentages. So for me, the biggest problem was basically trying to shift my mind from trying to find the holy grail and return massive amounts to actually realize that it's better to have more money and make smaller returns and basically trade with lower risk, essentially. Right, yeah. So, T, did you struggle with anything? Yeah, so for me, the biggest thing was, uh, obviously, before I met Michael, I was just doing silly things, jumping to jumping to strategies and, and jumping markets and not really, not really having a direction. But ultimately, two things I realized is, one, is accepting that you're going to be wrong. So for a lot of people, they'll, they'll go into a position, they'll open a trade, and it'll go against them, and they'll think, actually, you know what? No, it'll come back. And that is a very, very dangerous mindset because, okay, it might come back, but how much are you going to lose? How, you might get margin called at some point. Um, so, you know, you might be risking, you might be saying, I'm going to risk 1%, and then you don't have, a, you don't have a, a concrete stop loss, and it drops below or above that level, and it keeps dropping or keeps going against you. And, you know, wh where's that going to take you? How, what's the loss you're going to eventually have to sort of accept? Is it going to be 10%, 15%? And also risk management. So I realized that, you know, a huge part of trading is risk management because if you don't have a concrete plan, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous approach because ultimately when we first started trading stocks, so we were profitable, not as profitable as we are now, but we also didn't quite have our risk management in place. It was a bit... Like we knew we had a plan, but we didn't always stick to it. We'd sometimes risk too much. We'd sort of, you know, put, put our um, put our stop losses at quite arbitrary levels. Whereas when mm. we moved to FTMO, I think the fact that, you know, there's going from demo to real money, there's, there's money on the line. And it, it sort of forced us to really be very, very black and white with our, with our risk management to not make those mistakes that we were making uh, trading trading stocks. Yeah, I'd like to actually add to that. Basically, yeah. it's, it's a case of we used to focus on how much we can make, rather how much we can lose. And once every time now, we basically look how much are we risking. That's the first question. We don't care how much we can make. Our first question is how much we can lose. And I think for both of us, that was the biggest shift and our biggest progress was made. Because essentially, if you only focus on how much you can make, you'll make mistakes along the way because you're just going to try and make that money. Whereas if your first thing to solve is how much you can lose, I think that will take your trading a yeah. bit further. Yeah. So kind of going on from that, you, you mentioned that uh, trading like a small account, you have the kind of mentality of you need that big gain. Do you think that if someone's not profitable on a small account, they can be profitable on a larger account because they, they don't need to make that, well, quote unquote, big amount of money? I, th I mean, I think so. I mean, in my case, that's been the case, to be honest with you, because, I mean, I've traded a few small accounts in the past, and I mean, it's also a case of back then I had not the same experience, but, and also with us, it's we had FTMO with the big account. So basically, because FTMO was such a big end goal for us that we knew that if we get, if we pass it, basically, it's a life-changing amount of money to be trading with, basically. But with a small account, it's 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 almost easier to to risk more because... If you have a trade open and let's say you have one thousand pounds and you're you're risking two percent, it's twenty pounds in the line. Whereas if you're trading with a hundred thousand pounds, two percent is two thousand pounds. So you're a lot less likely to accept that big loss with a bigger amount because it's it's a bit psychologically it's a bit more difficult to deal with a bigger number. Um I think that it's if you can't trade a small account, it's all about psychology essentially. It's it's um how I put this. Basically, I was never really profitable on a small account. But going to a big account, I find it easier to trade with. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I, I would agree because if 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 you're if you're on a trade with with a thousand pounds and you're up, say know, two or three percent on on like on, on our kind of um, trading style, so you know it's a very sort of quite quite short term uh, trading. That's that's thirty quid. That ultimately that's not a lot of money. And you you can and we did this. You you forget that that's actually three percent. So if you had a hundred thousand, you know, you're looking at three thousand pounds. That's a lot of money. So it's scale. Obviously, it scales very quickly. So I would say, yeah, trading with a large account is easier as long as you stick to the plan. Because if if you don't, it's also a lot more destructive. Because if you lose ten percent off of a grand, 
that's not really that big of a deal. Let's be honest, it's, it's 100 quid, right? But if you're looking yeah. at 10% off of half a million, well, then you've got bigger issues. Yes. Um, and do you think that... So if someone isn't profitable on that small account, what do you think they need to do to become profitable on a larger account? Because obviously that's quite a big jump to go from not profitable with a small amount of money to being profitable with a large amount of money. I'm not sure like what kind of psychology you might need or I'm not really sure. I think it's important to basically disconnect yourself from the money. And again, hmm. stop thinking in terms of amount of pounds or pips, just think of the percentages. If you're making, for example, five to ten percent on two thousand pounds, that's still in percentages. That's not. It's not all of return in pounds. But again, you have to think about the percentage. Stop thinking about the pound value, if you like, because again, in trading, it's about percentages. And um, essentially, I think, yeah, I think the most important thing would be to basically disconnect yourself from the money and think in terms of percentages. That's my opinion. Also, you have to take a step back and think, why aren't you profitable on that small account? What what variable is it that, that's stopping you from achieving that? So if you have, for example, a strategy that you've back tested and that you know has a height and a 70% chance of, you know, ending you on, on a positive month, well, that then it's either you're just having a bad month or your execution is flawed. You're taking, you know, you're taking your, your wins too early. You're not disconnecting yourself from losses. So ultimately, if you do have that strategy that you know has a very high chance of probability, scaling up shouldn't really be a problem as long as everything else is nailed down. Yeah. I think I would like to add to that. Uh, Basically, it's um, it's also if you if you're demo trading or trading of real life, it's it's. I think our biggest shift in success happened when we started logging our trades. And essentially, what happened was we realized that every time we lost money, it was either simply because that day was. An unprofitable day or more often than not we found that it was due to us not following our plan so i think when you actually log every single trade open a spreadsheet whatever and log your trade entry exit and then write a little comment and basically every time you see that you lost money and if there was if you violated your rules that just shows that sometimes you lose money not because of strategy but because of your own little mistake basically i will agree to that yeah. well uh, when we started logging our trades uh, back when we were trading stocks uh, our sort of whole mentality and actual profit levels changed completely. We sort of started approaching it in a much more professional manner. And because all, ultimately it's a case of you, you don't want to have that mess up on your log. It, lo it looks bad. You know, if you, if you feel accountable for, for your trades, you're not going to want to have these huge losses and write, oh, you know, I was a I, I revenge trade pretty much. You just have to be honest with yourself ultimately. Yeah. And so do you use. Uh, any software to do that journaling or is it something that you just do maybe in Excel or something like that? Uh, well, right now, luckily for us, basically FTMO, like all the trades are being logged there. Um, so for my, myself, I basically, have, at the end of every month, I just essentially take a screenshot of all the trades I've taken and put them in into, well, just save a photo basically. But before FTMO, we essentially just did a spreadsheet of it and entered the stock we traded, basically time we entered, sort of direction and followed by a little comment saying what went right, what went wrong. Right, yeah. Um, so obviously, if you have been journaling for quite a long time, is there one trade that stands out that you can remember for a good or bad reason? Well, actually, I think I would say we've actually had a trade a few days ago that stands out to us because we... The way we trade, this is, this is only going for the DAX. DAX, the way we trade, we essentially trail our take profit and um, depending on the momentum of the market, the trend and everything. So the target profit, the actual target of the level was rather huge. Um, and we know when target is rather huge, the market doesn't typically go that low or high for that matter. So on that specific day, we were essentially up over 4%. And because our strategy said to us, well, it can keep going. We essentially didn't take that money. We just reduced our risk to the full capacity. And I mean, in the end, we ended up being stopped out for break even. And we weren't really that mad because we followed our plan. But at the same time, it's we left a lot of money on the table. So it's um, yeah. you have to sometimes realize that a losing trade is not a bad trade as long as you follow the plan. And in that case, okay, it was a lot of money to leave on the table. But at the same time, 
there's nothing else we could have done because our plan said to stay basically and um, and that's essentially that that trade stands out to us because it hurt for a little bit it's a lot of money especially for us we're rather you could call it the new professionals if you like but um at the same time we know that this is our plan and essentially it was a good trade you have to look at the bigger picture ultimately it's it's, it's one trade um yeah it's annoying obviously the potential of that trade was i think almost double that it was about four thousand dollars um you know you're gonna have those days where it just doesn't go according fully to plan uh, but all you can do is you can look back and say yeah i stuck to the plan i did what i could i i didn't I didn't make any mistakes there and ultimately the market just wasn't cooperating that day and that's you have to accept that that's a part of trading yeah do you think um in terms of because obviously you've guided each other through trading um has there been anyone else inside or outside of trading that you guys have learned from or that you look up to i, mean, I personally look up to a lot of people um i've been sort of, well, I can call them my mentors because, I mean, even though they haven't physically taught me really, but it's essentially, trading is a game where, well, actually, if you want to find success in anything, just basically find the best people in that business and follow them. So um, in my case, well, we mentioned Andrew Aziz from Bearable Traders and he's kind of the stock market side of things and we just love the way he trades. In my case, also, I followed Jason Grayson for a long time. Um, I just think he's not only a great Forex coach, but he also has tons of free advice on basically on wealth mindset basically and that sort of thing so he's, he's a great person to follow as well in my opinion and again I was etching crisis like the trade podcast I've listened to that for years as well now so essentially just basically finding the best people in the business and following them yeah okay and T did you have anyone that you uh, look up to uh, well, for myself, it's really just people that the Michael has shown me as well. Um, like I said, Andrew is his, um, Etienne. He's 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 great. Um, as as is uh, Jason Greystone and his and his uh, his advice. We also we also follow mm. uh, follow a, a guy called uh, Zed Monopoly on YouTube. Um, actually, he has a a pretty good actually a decent course on trading, sort of uh, as a beginner. Uh, again, focusing more on stocks, but just. For myself, it was also more about learning the mindset from him of that sort of stone cold discipline and and and, and not ultimately not being too greedy as well, which sometimes it's hard. Obviously, if you're up in a winning trade, to leave money on the table, you know it's so. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Zed as well. He was a uh, so someone just who again not quite the, the trading style that we subscribe to now, but it was it was more the psychology side of things for me, learning from him. Yeah, I would agree. The psychology from Zed was, yeah, definitely. Um, his his approach basically just stung with emotion, as T said, and that's that's another person I forgot to mention. As well, we actually followed them. There's a channel on YouTube called UK Spread Betting, and there's a guy called Mark. He runs that channel, seems to be, and he, he has a lot of great advice as well. So really just people, basically, people that are, again, have a good reputation in the business and essentially don't try to sell you dreams, but rather yeah. uh, a proper way to learn things, and that's that's about it, yeah. So have you guys done any courses um, in terms of psychology or uh, technical analysis? Um, I've, I've personally done courses in, in trading myself. Like I've taken a few Forex courses um, in the past. Um, but psychology-wise, we just essentially, well, again, T has a background in psychology, so it's, it's a lot of things basically we do from the gym as well. We compare a lot of the things to just normal life, essentially. It's like... So psychology-wise, we don't have to take any courses because I think in that area right now, we're quite solid, so... Yeah. I was going to say, um, in terms of what you guys have been talking about, the mentality uh, seems to be what makes you guys profitable. Um, what would you say is the thing that makes you profitable? I think, yeah, what you said there, mentality is one thing because, um, again, we, we went from essentially crying about every single loss we took to now being uh, basically stone cold with the emotions like it's we will lose we have no it has no effect on our day at all we win is the same case it's um essentially it's it's when you really disconnect yourself from that win or loss and if you follow the plan there's nothing else you could have done there's all it's almost like a, there's like a little flow chart if you like it's do you have a problem if the answer is yes can you change it no, then don't worry. Yes, you can change it. No, don't worry. 
and if you have a problem you can't and, and you don't have a problem well then don't worry either so it's basically just a very simple approach to just not get the trade not let the don't let the trading get the better of you basically just disconnect yourself from it i agree with that mentality is at least in my opinion probably the most important thing in this business obviously you need it you need a, you need a strategy you need, you need to have a profitable strategy but that being said there are so many strategies you can follow that will make you money it's a case of will you stick to it and ultimately will you stick to it when it's a losing month or say a, a, a losing three months even because that's possible and how you deal with that in your own mind is ultimately what it comes down to it's everything you know everything stems from the mind so if you if you've got that nailed down then you probably won't have any issues absolutely so do you how long did it take you guys to develop that kind of mindset um because obviously it doesn't seem like it's something that i mean i don't know but it doesn't seem like something that can just be switched on and off for someone that hasn't had the training i guess you could say or the experience of doing that well i would say for a lot of practice um yeah uh all t- we started working like seriously on trading together in september was it Let's september say. last year and well ever since then it, it took our first three four months we we didn't have that mindset we we sort of knew what we were getting at you know we were kind of on the right track but we certainly weren't there ultimately came we, we really got it when we started with ftmo because then then you're accountable you know then you then you can't make those mess ups you, everything has to be you know a, go, going according to plan so i mean it took and obviously if you look at the bigger picture as well from you know when we both started our journeys in trading you know it's a few years so it, it can take a while but it really you really just have to practice and practice and you know again learn learn from the best it's really hard to it's, it's really hard to, to learn these things yourself or to uh, obviously both of us were helped by you know people people on youtube and you know and and and, and, and books that were written on trading so how the rules i mean essentially basically what was for us um it's almost a case of our backs were against the wall and we kind of had a option to either you stick to 100 percent or it's gonna take too long so we knew that FTMO was a life-changing opportunity for us so we basically had to take our team to the next level because again the end goal was so big that if we failed it then it's it's almost knocks up knocks back your confidence yeah. and also speaking about the solid mindset it's, it's we've when we've met we sort of clicked the right way because we seem to have the same vision um and basically again we're back to the gym we are the gym and we always analyzed our performance in the gym and almost the same way it's like basically practicing the same thing every single day and you will become good at it at some point it's just no way around it because it's that's how it, that's how life works really <laughs> yeah it's about, it's about uh, every day you know turning up and I uh, can build a house and you lay a, a brick one by one you know you don't just build a house in a day it takes it takes a long long time yeah um so obviously you guys are quite short term traders and you've successful um with ftmo do you think that swing traders or longer term traders can be profitable with ftmo um because i know that they've got some rules haven't they around uh trading i think if you're a longer term trader i think again it goes back to what i said before about really knowing your strategy and i'm sure they let you open trades overnight um i, I don't think they let you open trades over the weekend again i'm not 100 percent sure because that's not with the way we trade but you can still swing trade as long as you know your strategy very well and um, as long as you have enough setups the reason we like short-term trading basically is because for example a trend on the daily chart will take say a week or two to to, to form whereas on on a five minute chart you have many intraday trends and there's like just basically a lot more opportunity to trade but going back to the question i think swing traders can easily pass the challenge but i think it again comes down to really knowing your strategy and knowing your numbers and preparing for the worst and um again just be very prepared yeah and the kind of final question here is what would you say is the number one piece of advice for anyone looking to do ftmo well i think my my opinion is well you obviously have to know to trade and you need to have some experience under your belt and 
that's why they sort of have a fee because they just they don't just want people randomly trading and basically making some money out of luck. You need to be decent if you're trading and I really think FDMO, even if you fail the challenge, it will still make you a better trader because you really nail down your risk management. And I think a lot of people have said that, like reading other people's testimonials, it seemed that FDMO has at least improved their trading in terms of risk management and, and basically emotional control. But number one, yeah, advice is basically just know your strategy very well and, um, and just remember to stick with the plan. Okay. Cool. Um, and T, do you have any psychology tips for people looking to do FTMO? I completely agree with what Michael said again. So to begin, obviously, have that strategy. Make have, make sure you've back tested it. Make, know the statistics. Know you know and the, the potential success rate. And then, yeah, from from a sort of psychology perspective, is stick to the plan. You know, you can't have emotions here. You, it's you need to be incredibly black and white in your trades. You need to have, you, need, you know, you can't be chasing. If you have a certain, you know, uh, a certain target for a win, you know, take that money. Don't think, oh, it will keep going. Well, okay, what happens if you leave that trade open and it, and it doesn't and it, and it drops back down? You know, it stops you out. Just stick to the plan. You have to have that stone cold discipline, and. For me and for Michael as well, I think that that's really what what made us pass the challenge and is making us more successful traders every day. Oh, the hundred percent agree. Yeah. I'd also like to say basically, also understand that the challenge is probably the most difficult part of it because that's where you actually have the biggest profit target. Um, so this is the most difficult part. But then remember how, like in our case, we knew that the opportunity was massive for in our case, life changing to an extent. So just remember how the end goal is really. It's a huge opportunity. So um, the challenge is the hardest part. So you might have to make some tweaks for the challenge if your strategy hasn't been really returning as much an amount. But then, for example, the second stage, you have twice as long and the target is, well, it's, it's only it's half the target, basically. And then once you're a trader of them, then there is no target at all. So it's, again, it's the challenge is the hardest part. And if you can prepare well for that, then if you can prepare well for that, then you can go really far with it. And also from a mindset perspective is never give up. Because you don't know, you don't know if you're gonna have a bad month in the market. Like, you know, your strategy could have like a 80% chance of either making you 10, 15% a month, whatever it is. And say you say you, you don't, you, you know, you fail, you lose 5% in the month. Try again. You know, you just had a bad month. Never give up. And it's the same if you're funded as well. If you go, if you're going through a hard time, if you're not making money that month, that's fine. You know, look at the bigger picture. You can't make money every month. Ultimately, it's. it's I'm sure some people probably do it, but it's it's hard. It's 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 really difficult. So you just have to just have to have resilience around you uh, and accept that you're not always gonna make money, but don't, yeah. don't let that bring you down. Absolutely. 